The mystery of Glastonbury is a magnet that draws many pilgrims from all parts of the world. This mystery is threefold, each part connected to the others, though enacted on this single stage at widely different periods of time. The town has grown up around its abbey, once the greatest of all our cathedrals. But this itself was built over a Celtic church of hoary antiquity, so sacred that the Saxon monk claimed it was constructed by no human art, but prepared by the very heavens themselves for the salvation of men. Some said it was built by Joseph of Arimathea, who had fled to Britain with 12 companions soon after the crucifixion, bearing with him the Holy Grail. This legend also relates how Joseph, a wealthy Phoenician tin trader, brought his nephew Jesus with him on earlier visits. It was this tradition that inspired William Blake to write, and did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green, and was the Holy Lamb of God in England's pleasant pastures seen? Did they come or not? This is Glastonbury's first mystery. Here at least is where Christianity first came to Britain, and at a very early date. But here too is Arthur's seat. Our earliest saga is centered in Avalon, where he kept his round table. His legends claim Joseph of Arimathea as ancestor of his chief grail questing knights thus connecting Glastonbury's first and second mysteries together. Arthur and Guinevere are said to be buried here among many kings and saints, including St. Patrick, St. Bridget, and St. David of Wales. Here was a national shrine even before the Saxon invasions. Indeed, Gwynab Nudd, lord of the Celtic underworld, held court on the Tor before Christians ousted him. The abbey was called the secret of the Lord and for centuries held in awe. But what this secret really enshrined is hidden in the landscape below. This is Glastonbury's third mystery, binding all three in one. Its great temple of the stars, the Glastonbury giants or zodiac, found an origin of all these legends. In a huge circle 10 miles across, Nature herself has modelled by hills and valleys the twelve signs of the zodiac, partly outlining them by streams. Ancient roads, paths, canals and earthworks complete the drawing. The whole design appears to be a grand geomantic compact between nature and man. Too big to be seen, too good to be true, some say. Yet these figures appear clearly on the map, and about a hundred significant place names and many local legends confirm them. Catherine Maltwood, who found this circle in the 1920s, was a sculptor. Perhaps this gave her an affinity with these great earth sculptures. They appeared as she studied the map while illustrating the high history of the Holy Grail with an itinerary of the night's quest in Avalon. Written about 1200 in Glastonbury Abbey, the book accurately describes the landscape, and as the knights encountered a lion in their adventures, she was amazed when Leo leapt out at her from the map, his underside drawn by the river Carey. When a giant baby appeared next, modelled by Dundon and loll over hills, she remembered that Avalon had long been haunted by a lion and a giant. An astrologer friend realised that their placing suggested Leo and Gemini in a zodiac, and soon the whole design was revealed. After long research, she wrote her books, Glastonbury's Temple of the Stars and The Enchantments of Britain, in the tower of this Victorian castle on the Polden Hills overlooking her zodiac. 
As her intuitive discovery was largely ignored in her lifetime, this film and these books are a tribute to her genius and an attempt to further her work which she herself described as unfinished. She died in Vancouver Island, Canada in 1961 at Thatched Lodge. Her sculpture and art collection are now in Victoria University. She claimed her circle as the original round table with Arthur and his chief knights still seated about it as the zodiac signs and the months and seasons of the year. Early Grail legends support her, saying that the round table was made by Merlin, not without great significance, to signify the round world, the round canopy of the stars and planets, and many other things. Mallory's Mort Dartha describes the round table as a great rack in a field that could feed 4,000 people and 150 bulls. No mere banqueting board, this, but a large tract of land. A table, yes, but a table of measurement, a cosmic timetable, measuring, among many other things, the destiny and purpose of man. This, then, is the church not made by human art, but prepared by the very heavens themselves for the salvation of men. Grail knights were questing their own signs, themselves, studying the Zodiac's ancient system of psychology and obeying the command, man, know thyself. Wells Cathedral, six miles north of Glastonbury, confirms Arthur's time connections in its medieval clock. Jack Blandifus strikes the hour while four nights, its quarters and the four seasons revolve and joust. Arthur, lord of this starry round table, was thus a sun king, for the zodiac is the path of the sun, moon and planets. Is it just poetic chance that the sunset line from the great sun clock at Stonehenge runs west down Glastonbury Abbey's nave, lighting Arthur's grave. It enters the eastern gate via Dodd Lane, a name indicating a ley line, and strikes St. Bayon's Church, just west of the Abbey. Catherine Maltwood, noting the many Neolithic roads around Glastonbury and the fact that Seven's Banks were thickly colonised by megalithic builders, whose route from Chaldea to Britain is marked by stone monuments, concluded that it was Sumerians seeking metal nearly 5,000 years ago who first developed Avalon's landscape. Great astrologers, they recognized a potential zodiac in its hills. Expert in terraced agriculture and irrigation, they completed it with canals, paths, and earthworks, making a ziggurat or maze of the tour for stargazing. Great earth sculptures occur elsewhere, like the Nazca figures of Peru, but this zodiac is far the largest, most complex scheme yet found. Perhaps it inspired our habit of cutting hill figures. Ancient Britons, she argued, were called Chaldees. Druid Christians were Chaldees. The Welsh Cymru remember their early immigration from an eastern summer land, perhaps the Sumer's land. Many western place names like Karnak, Ryada, Marazion have eastern parallels. Was Somerset's summer county the Sumer's seat? Did the old form of Somersault, a Somerset, remember this great turning wheel? Let's look at this wheel in detail. Here is Aries, 
a paschal lamb with head reverted. Taurus, only his head and foot, as in many old zodiacs. Gemini, Cancer, not a crab, but the ship Argo Navis, a neighbouring constellation. Leo, Virgo, with her wheat sheaf. Libra, a dove, but shaped like the scales. Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, a phoenix rising with the new year, and Pisces, with the whale Cetus among its fishes. The signs are in correct order and well proportioned to each other. The two fish and the twins match their partners in size. All heads face west or towards Gemini. And lastly, the zodiac stars fit their corresponding signs when the planisphere is placed over the map to scale. Can all this be chance? But can't one find such shapes on any map, critics complain. One, even two maybe, but twelve in proportion, in a circle, in correct order, fitting their corresponding stars. The odds against this are calculated at 480 million to one. Add the place names and legends. The evidence for design seems overwhelming. A huge hound guards the circle's western approaches. The river parrot drawing his underside from his nose at Athelney to his back leg at Langport. He is Arthurian legend's questing beast whose gurgling belly betrayed him to knights who sought him. This, said Mrs. Maltwood, was the river parrot's noisy springtide boar. The Somerset Wassail song remembers the girt dog of Langport who burned his long tail. He is girt in two ways. Tethered by Leesway drove to hook on his collar and girt, great, being all of five miles long. Some 25 place names like Curload, Earlake Moor on his ear and Wag on his tail show that he was once well known. Alfred's fort at Boroughbridge convolutes his nose, guarding the Zodiac's water gate where Tone and Parrot rivers meet. Its ruined church is St. Michael's, like the Tours Tower 12 miles northeast. Both lie on John Michel's dragon line of Michael dedications, stretching across Britain from St. Michael's Mount Cornwall to Suffolk. Alfred's cakes burnt at Athelney were no accident, thought Mrs. Mortwood, but a ritual sought to Cerberus fed into the tone, the dog's tongue, to placate him before entering Avalon's mysteries. Was Alfred an initiate? His, his father's ancestors had Celtic names, and Celtic kings inherited a great secret. To quote an old Welsh poem, there is a greater secret known to few beside the river of spectres. Coonan shall obtain it when he comes to reign. Was Sumerian Gilgamesh an initiate too? In his epic, he traveled to the far west seeking eternal life and sailed up the river Parati to the place where the star gods dwell. Or Odysseus, for he traded in metals to the far west and encountered Cerberus when entering the underworld of the gods in the foggy land of the Cimmerians, the Cymri. He called this place an infernal sky. Where but our zodiac, its stars reflected on earth. Joseph of Arimathea was another tin trader. Langport Church portrays him in medieval glass with two fish-shaped cruets, perhaps symbols for Christianity, whose earliest sign was the fishes, not the cross. 
Legend they may be, these Eastern Mariner pilgrims, but they represent real men who did come here from the early Bronze Age onwards. Leo was the first figure Mrs. Maltwood found. Ruled by the sun, he represents high summer, as this clue on his tale at King's Western suggests. Here is Lancelot, surely the lion of the round table. Catsham. Catsash hundred. And Catsgore, recall this great cat, whose front paw flattened Somerton, one Somerset's capital. Saxon kings had a castle here on Royal Leo. Lion heads adorn its old market cross. Lions name its ends. Lion and unicorn still support our royal arms, a zodiac secret, for they are its summer and winter signs. Unicorn and white heart stemming from wintry Capricorn. Somerton's footballers are called the lions. Solar football was once played in the church, marking the sun's passage from east to west, for balls have been found in the rafters. Perhaps the angels caught them. Where better to celebrate the sun than at Somerton, once the summer county's county town? Leo Lancelot, Lance of Light, is king of this world, lord of life, love, and earthly delights. His only overlord is Arthur of Sagittarius's house of higher mind, the mysteries of a higher world. These three fire signs, Sagittarius, Aries and Leo, on Stoke sub Hamden's church porch near Leo's effigy, must be a zodiac clue. Here is Leo's head. From the air, his wooded mane obscures the paths and ancient lynchets defining his nose and jaws. The River Carey draws his underside. Dominating Romans felt at home on Leo. They had quarries here. Their villas bordered Somerton Lane, his back. A Roman cemetery here yielded lion's claws, sun symbol of life renewed. This track forms part of a pilgrim's path round the zodiac, partly defining each figure in turn. Virgo seems more witch than virgin, with nutcracker jaws and tall Breton bonnet. Her wheat sheaf makes her queen of September harvests, and as the river Carey draws her from top to toe, here is the first old mother Carey of British folklore, who is also Kore, or Ceres, the earth mother of the Middle East, goddess of cereals. In Wales she is Ceridwen, in Cornwall perhaps St Cain, for Cainton Mandeville is on her wheat sheaf. The rigid old Fosway makes an unaccustomed bow to kiss her hand. Annis Hill is near her head, Anscombe at her feet. So she is also Black Annis, the old British witch. Anne is always the mother of the Virgin. On her breast is a large barrow called Wimbled Toot. Toot, an old form of teat, often named mounds and hills. Poetic ancient Britons saw these as the breasts of their earth mother. Much of London's milk, collected at Wincanton, comes from Virgo's fertile dairy land. Bad Carey's legend tells how a royal child was hidden here on Virgo's swelling womb, though who he was is now forgotten. Is he not every man? For Mother Carey bears and rears us all. However, Bab Carey's church remembers Mother Carey's baby. The River Carey's source at Castle Carey is called the Seven Lady Springs. 
and this inn stands nearby. Can we add Britannia to her many names? Virgo can be youthful too. Look again at her air photo. Traces of another face appear, young and beautiful, with two hollows for eyes, but still flood after rain. A farm lane for nose, a deep ditch, now sadly filled in, was her smiling mouth. So here, as the village of Queen Camel hints, is Guinevere, Queen of Camelot. It was her father, Leo de Grance, another Leo, who gave Arthur the round table as her marriage diary. Was Cadbury Castle, the traditional Camelot, his stronghold? Did Guinevere then love Lancelot as a father figure? She leans with longing towards Leo's fireside, forsaking wintry Arthur. The earth goddess prefers her sun god's hot. Here is her head and wheat sheaf, even 10,000 feet up. This is all we can see of her at once, for this queen of the land is four miles long. Libra, though shaped like the scales, is a dove displaced from its usual position to dive from Sagittarius's head towards Virgo. The word from the Creator, quickening Mother Earth, virgin soil. Dove is an old past tense for dive. Old maps mark Hurtle Pool on its wing. Christian annunciations use this spirit symbol, though it is far older. Druids, who knew that sun rays bring life to the earth, called it the Awan, white wings. Their sign for it, the broad arrow, still persists today on benchmarks and government property. Bards invoked its inspiration. The Libran scales only appeared in Roman times, being formed from Scorpio's claws. As Libra is displaced here, its stars don't correspond, but the plow stars which do fall on the dove are eloquent. Chaldeans call them Bel Mo Sarah, Lord Bell's word from the stars. Here is the dove from the air. Like Libra, it is an airy sign. Both are peaceable, gentle, communicative. Barton St. David was surely named when its image was mapped and known, for Dove and David share the same Welsh root. Bards often invoke Dew Duffit, God the Inspirer, or Holy Spirit. The church portrays two Davids, one the Welsh patron saint whose pet dove always flew before him, the other the biblical King David playing his harp. Have they confused the two? Not so. All doves and Davids are divine messengers relaying heavenly harmonies to earth. Not one, but two presidents of America came from Barton St. David's old manor. Their descendant, Evangeline Adams, was the first to broadcast astrology by radio across the United States. The dove relaying its message. They say that St. Dunstan, alchemist abbot of Glastonbury and advisor to Saxon kings, was baptized at Tootle Bridge on the dove's wing. This stretch of the River Brew is still called Dunstan's Dyke. Was Tootle, Turtle, Saxon for Turtle Dove? The baptism in Jordan reenacted, its dove hovering overhead. Did Dunstan know the secret? Born of royal blood at Baltonsborough nearby, he may have done for he crowned four Saxon kings at another zodiac at Kingston-on-Thames. What is this dove in Grail legend? In Parsifal, it flies before the Grail procession, a censer swinging from its beak. Scorpio's tail stings Sagittarius's horse, for this is the zodiac's death sign, November, heralding the dying year. It's the least convincing of Mrs. Maltwood's figures, so here is another attempt, 
drawn by the many irrigation ditches on this watery sign. Odd place names like Forefoot and Bridgefoot Bridge hint at possible legs, and the map shows traces of them here and there. Elusive Scorpio hides himself and works in secret. The brew has flooded his effigies so often that a warning horn was blown from Horn Blotton Church Tower, Horn Blowtown. The Zodiac's water signs are all liable to floods, and how apt that Arthur's funeral barge, westering down the brew to Avalon, enters through its death sign. Arthur's Bridge here remembers his passing. In the round table, Scorpio is Mordred, Arthur's envious son, who plots to seize his father's wife and crown. Scorpio, the arch-critic, the revolutionary, destroys the old order, and Mordred betrayed Lancelot and Guinevere to Arthur, bringing the round table down in civil war. But he was killed in the holocaust he'd raised, and this old pew end at Alford on the brew reminds Scorpio of the fable that he can sting himself to death with his own venom. Scorpio needs to criticize himself. His highest role is to die to his old self and be reborn. At Ditchet Church off the Foss Way, famous for gargoyles, a medieval mural shows Marshal Scorpio at his best. St. Christopher, an ambitious soldier, would serve none but an invincible king. But as each in turn was vanquished, he despaired of worldly glory, turned hermit, and used his great strength to carry travellers across a torrent. One stormy night he took a child across but its weight increased until it seemed he bore the whole world on his shoulders and, stumbling, only just reached the further bank. It was the Christ child, the invincible king at last. Does his dead staff, miraculously sprouting at the head, symbolize Martian energy sublimated up the spine to activate the creative pineal? This Assyrian priest, with his scrotal bag in one hand, a pineal cone in the other, suggests this teaching is far older than Christianity. Sagittarius is usually a centaur, but in this ancient zodiac, he is a mounted king dragged over his horse's neck. Though centaur-like, this makes sense, which centaurs don't. Is this figure the origin of them all? His effigy is remarkably dynamic and alive. The path drawing his mount's neck can be seen within his torso. And with Cantor's green and breech lane on his well-defined breeches, can we doubt that he was once well known? His helmet and beard are strangely Sumerian in type. This stream draws his profile, with the bridge of his nose just where it should be. On his forehead is a little waterfall named Baltimore's Flights. Did they mourn here the flight of Bell's departing spirit? For the water rushes down like life blood into the fleeing dove's wing. And was Baltimore's pyramid hill on his back once sacred to Bell? For Sagittarius is the sun king of many names who must die for his people and be forever reborn. On his back fall the stars of Hercules, the sun hero whose twelve labors typifies the initiate struggles with the zodiac houses of his own nature. In the east, Sagittarius was the sun god Ahura, to Britons, he is Arthur, Mort d'Arthur, the dying son of December, yet destined to rise again. His great shadow, long forgotten, still lies stretched across five miles of the Vale, always associated with his name. Arthur's dreams echo our zodiac. In Lehrman's Brute, he dreams that while his hall falls down, 
A lion takes him in its jaws to the sea, where a whale swallows him, spewing him out Jonah-like after three days. In other legends, he dreams before his last battle that he sits in state high on fortune's wheel, till at midday she frowns and turns it, throwing him upside down among venomous beasts who all take him by a limb. On our wheel, he is indeed upside down, stung by Scorpio from ominously named Hell Ditch, the whale's jaws and snake's head mangling his arm. The star map confirms this serpent. The stars of Draco, the dragon, fit it perfectly. At Butley, legend tells how a knight in shining armour cuts off the head of a snake each year in Park Wood. St George, St Michael, Arthur, Sagittarius is all of these. Butley is the circle's centre. Its squire told Mrs. Maltwood that people outside the parish often asked to be buried in its churchyard, calling it the most holy grave. So when Butley Court encroached on it in the 19th century, villagers cursed it, predicting that the house would fall down in a hundred years. It happened. Left empty in the last war, it became a ruin. However, it is now rebuilt as flats. The feet of Sagittarius's horse sink into Capricorn's back, the foot of its rider into his horn. A unicorn's horn, single and straight, it is an ancient earthwork nearly a mile long called Pontus Ball, a name derived, they say, from Pontus Vallum, wall of the bridge. But there is no bridge here. The Etruscan word Pontes, ritual sacrifice, makes better sense, thus the sacrifice of Bell for it is locally known as the Golden Coffin. Here, then, is the winter solstice grave of the dying sun. But in the zodiac, the grave is not the end. The buried seed springs up again, the sun returns, and the god who personifies them both triumphs over death. Capricorn is both unicorn and white heart in heraldry. Chased by every prince of folklore, he cools his weary feet in the heart lake, his heart pounding at hearty moor. A goat, they say, still haunts the tor. Two aged oaks, Gog and Magog, on his nose, may be descended from a dreary grove, for Capricorn, ruled by Saturn's old father Time, is Merlin, Arthur's druid, heir to ageless wisdom. Capricorn is man, slowly evolving through time, trial, and error. His feet are in primeval slime, but launched from Launchley Hill, he noses the tor. For goats are born to the mountain, and man to immortality. His goal, the tor, is the hill of resurrection, ascension. A finger pointing heavenward, it dominates the landscape. It models the head of an eagle or phoenix, which stands here for Aquarius. Both birds denote rebirth. This bird is a water carrier too, for it bears chalice well in its beak. Aquarius was Ganymede, the perfected man in the mysteries, for his beauty made cupbearer to the gods and flown to Olympus on eagle's wings. There's an eagle on the Taurus tower. The phoenix, a calendar bird, flew dying to Heliopolis, Egypt's city of the sun, burnt itself to ashes in a funeral pyre of spices on top of a pyramid, and flew away reborn. Surely Ashwell Lane and Cinnamon Lane on the Taurus Pyramid remember this, while Actis Fields below celebrate Actis, son of Sol, who founded Heliopolis. These ancient myths stem from the zodiac, which taught that here, at the eleventh hour, was the escape from the recurring wheel of lives, but only for those who had mastered all its tests. Those who fail return to life's school once more, through Pisces, in water.
where all life begins. From the Tours commanding height, the pilgrim in this mystery looks back, like the phoenix, along the chain of lives mirrored in the zodiac landscape below. Drinking the water of life at Chalice Well and gazing into its depths, he sees his own nature and purpose reflected. For the Tour is Grail Castle, where Percival, the perfected knight, could pierce the veil and perceive all. Here, the mists of the Vale of Avalon dissolve, the two worlds intersect. In this well, they say, Joseph of Arimathea hid the grail, containing the crucified Christ's blood, making its waters ever after run red. Hence its other name, Blood Spring, to the scientist, this colouring is iron, but to the poet, all myths and religions meet and mingle in its flow. Gilgamesh, Ulysses, Ganymede, Christ himself are here. Water becomes blood and wine. Legend tells how Joseph, landing on Pisces' weary old hill with his twelve companions, wearied all, planted his staff here. Sprouting, it flowered magically at Christmas as well as Easter for centuries until an angry Puritan cut it down. But cuttings planted here and round the abbey still flower at these times. Sprays are sent to the Queen at Christmas to prove it, and botanists class it as a Mediterranean thorn. What an extraordinary coincidence that Joseph landed on Pisces, bringing the new faith of the Piscean age. The sun is now entering Aquarius, but Glastonbury too is on this cusp in our zodiac. Has it a message for the Aquarian age? Piscean Weary All, also called Fisher's Hill, is clearly fish-shaped. It is the Fisher King's Castle of Grail legend. Pompal's Bridge, the perilous bridge in those legends, is on the fish's mouth. Here, some say, Arthur threw Excalibur into the brew. This river draws the whale, who drags the Sun King down at sunset and year's end into the sea. With Scorpio behind him, he is between the devil and the deep. But whale's jaws on the abbey gate hang like a trophy from this unending battle of darkness and light. Joseph has an underground chapel in the abbey. Old records tell how King Arviragus granted the missionaries the famous twelve hides of Glastonbury to maintain them. Were these not the twelve hidden figures, the zodiac animal hides, entrusted to Christians since the Druid collapse? The Romans destroyed the old Druid order in 61 AD. Joseph is said to have come here in 63. The second fish springs from the ram's head at Street. In astrology, Pisces rules the feet. How odd that Street should be famous for its shoes. Both Clark's and Morland's factories are here. Ares Ram is hornless, his head reverted like the paschal lamb. Still, he is ruled by Mars and shows battle scars on Walton Hill. Note how the fields model his haunches. No surprise that Street is also famed for sheepskins. Is this the first golden fleece sought by Jason? His ship Argo lies just below. Young, bold, pioneering, Ares is just like Gawain, Arthur's nephew, the first to seek the grail. Ares is the zodiac's first sign, but like Ares, he soon tires and fails to finish his quest. Taurus is more solid. As the zodiac's house of money, he must be wealthy Sir Hector, chosen by Merlin to foster the infant Arthur and faithful Taurus, Hector Protector, 
oversees the Gemini Bay. Ancient lynchers carve his horns. Collard Hill is on his collar. An unconscious impulse to add another horn has crowned him with the Hood Monument, and aptly, Admiral Hood on the bull received the Order of St. Ferdinand. Only Taurus's head and foot appear, as usual, in old zodiacs. His position due east in the design helped Mrs. Maltwood date her find, for a line drawn from his star Aldebaran to Scorpio's star Antares bisects the circle east-west. These are two stars of the Grand Cross, which in 2700 BC marked the main compass points. Sagittarius's finger points to the circle's centre, and his eye and that of Taurus both lie upon this line. The archer aims at the bullseye. These, among other clues, convinced her that this zodiac was developed in the dawning Bronze Age, when Taurus was the zodiac's first sign. Glastonbury's tithe barn shows how these compass points, bull, lion, eagle, and a man, became, under Christianity, signs for the four gospel makers. The bull's foot rests on a ship's mast, as the crab's water sign is missing, this ship, equally aquatic, takes its place. Argo Navis lies near Cancer in the sky. The moon rules Cancer, the zodiac's maternal sign, and this crescent ship cradles a baby. It is the moon boat of Isis and Horus her babe, the crescent moon of Mary, queen of heaven, with her divine son. Could the crab say all this? Female Cancer and the male fertilizing spirit Libra, both displaced here, held a doctrine of the incarnating God-man long before Christianity. Cancer, the vessel of nature, must bear the man to whom all the zodiac creatures turn in hope. This vessel, all cut by dikes that drain Sedmore's marsh, has often been flooded. It explains local legends, a ship that sailed up under street and disappeared, another that birthed Krulis at Minehead, Solomon's ship of Grail legend, mysterious echo from the Holy Land. Murray and Morgan, before this zodiac was discovered, wrote that Druid rites featured a babe in a boat as the newborn son, but the theme is worldwide. Countless sun heroes began life at the mercy of the waves. The second twin lies nearby, on Bankham and Bradley Hills, in a meditative half-lotus. This lane draws his chest. Sirius, brightest of stars, marks his heart, where springs hopefully respond. Lollover Hill mows the first twin's body. Does this odd name refer to his bowed head on Dundon's steep, rounded hill? These hills together resemble a giant babe half buried in the earth, and with Weiriol's fish, doubtless helped the first colonists to recognize a zodiac. Where but in Dundon Church could we find twin memorials put up by twins? Gemini's star fall on his hand, Orion's great stars on his body, but Orion too was a son of the sun and mother earth. So here in Solomon's ship, the ship of Sol the sun, sits the young son, submissive to his royal fate. Like his father, he must die for his creation. Here is a double image of once child and man, his Christ-like head, though striking, is far older, being profiled by ramparts of a Bronze Age camp, 
Yet ramparts use the steepest contours, so nature herself, it seems, traced him first. Ancient fields and lynches define his ribs. A barrow on Dundon Beacon is his pineal. When lit, he becomes Taliesin, radiant brow. William Blake said, all religions are one. When we remember that the Phoenician Trinity's divine son was Jesu Munu, and in the Druidic Trinity, Isis or Hesus, we can only wonder. Galahad, the Round Table's Christ-like knight, must stem from this effigy. The second twin is Percival, the boy from the backwoods, who follows Galahad, his ideal, until they sail together in Solomon's ship to achieve the grail in the faraway city of Saras. But as Saras means stars, it seems they are already there. Gemini's twins signify man, half animal, half divine, and destined for the stars. And now to sum up what we can glean from this zodiac's message. Restoring cosmic meaning to ancient doctrines, it unifies all faiths and faith with science. Replacing the waterman with a phoenix leaves only three human signs, revealing the zodiac's original trinity as an equilateral triangle across the circle, its essential feminine influence restored. The ancients held that by these three creative forces interacting and descending through ever lower levels from finest radiation to densest matter, the worlds are born. But this quickening ray evokes an upward response from the depths and life begins to evolve, slow and simple at first, but with gathering speed and complexity. The seasonal cycle of birth, growth and death thus engendered is no vicious circle but shows that evolution had both direction and purpose. All nature is subject involuntarily to this cycle, but we, with our dawning self-awareness, are able to cooperate with its aim willingly if we choose. The zodiac signs typify all animal life from fishes and crustaceans to man and show the development of eons compressed into nine months in Gemini's fetus. Evolution, this zodiac hints, is aiming at ever heightening consciousness and seeing past our present ego-centered state to Gemini's man-to-be. The quest of the grail but in quickening inert matter, spirit loses impetus. Thus, the ancients held that the god must die. Illustrating this by the rising and dying of the life-giving sun, his symbol, they taught that we too, in self-giving, become godlike and will be translated to a more vibrant sphere. So Osiris died mourned down the Nile by the triple goddess Isis. So Christ, tended in death by three weeping Marys. So Arthur, ferried to Avalon by three mourning queens, yet promising to return in our time of need. Is this rediscovery in the Vale of Avalon the fulfillment of his promise?